The 2023 May Conference. Matt Grayson, Depth Dictates Doubles Decisions. This session was held classroom due to rain. We looped the ball back deep and we charged the net and bellied up to the net and she lobbed us. And we almost forced the lob to happen and we put ourselves out of position when the lob came, so now we're in a bad place. So we wanted to make sure that we kind of got them to understand what to look for to gather better information when they're playing so they made better choices and saw things more the right way. Um, so there's a, a marketing principle out there that says, hey, by the time you tell somebody something seven times, they start to recognize that you're trying to tell them something. They don't know what it is, but you're trying to tell them that something's coming. Okay? So how many, I mean, I know everybody that's worked at a club has had this, where you send out an email, it's in the newsletter, it's posted on the wall, it's posted on the tennis court, you tell them during the lesson, and then three days later, one of them goes, is there something happening tonight? And they don't even recognize it. You've told them a million times. So the same thing kind of happens when we started. We started taking that principle towards our lessons too. Is we really slowed down the process of how fast we progressed in the lessons. Like made them do each individual thing a lot longer, and even sometimes for multiple weeks. Instead of saying, "Hey, this week's going to be approach first volley. This week's you know work on the serve. This week's our cross court return. Whatever." It was really trying to stay within this one framework for a season. And make them stick to that, and that's really kind of kind of changed what we've seen. Um, the, we think it's working because the success rate we've had is we have in the last three out the season we've had seven city champions, um, and it's they're just seeing the right things and making better adjustments. And so with that, I, they're they're starting to really kind of buy into the system too because they're seeing even if their team hasn't won, they're seeing the teams around them winning, and so they they've kind of bought into it and have changed how they've approached um, play. So with the thing that we picked this year, you can do this with almost any topic, but the one that we did this year, and I'll kind of give you guys an example of how we went through it, was we just talked about depth of shot. And when we started thinking about that, it's super simple. Everybody talks about hit the ball deep, hit the ball short, like the opposite of where everybody is. But we started trying to figure out, like, what are the ladies seeing when they're playing? And what we noticed was we would start, like the first step that we did in this, we put everybody back to the baseline. We said, hey, we're just going to rally with one ball for everybody hitting the ball, just kind of like a warm-up. But what we want you to do is, as the ball's crossing the net, I want you to call out a one, two, or three. And what we did is we took the tennis court and divided it into thirds. So from about the net to about you know, two-thirds of the way back in the service box was one, two-thirds of the way service box back to about halfway no man's land was two, and the back half of no man's land, the back half of the, the back box was three. And just said, hey, as the ball's crossing the net, I want you to call out one, two, or three, to try to anticipate where the ball is going to land. And it took everybody about 10 minutes to be able to call the ball out before it bounced. Every ball comes in, bounces three, and then they would back up. Well, it's already on them. Like, then you can't get back. So in all those drills we were doing, it's like, hey, you got to see the deep ball. you got to back up. you got to create space at that ball. They're just not recognizing early enough to actually make that move even when we want them to make that move. So. We had to do that for quite a while, and what we also found out was their judgment when they did start calling it early was fairly bad <laughs> at, at best. Like, you know, the balls would be coming high and deep, and they're like, one! And it's like, no, it's 15 feet deeper than you thought it was going to land. So we also used that point to kind of express to our ladies, like, hey, when you guys are in matches and you're playing out points and you're looking 70 feet away at a shot and you mentally get wrecked because you think that lady just hooked you on a call, you missed where that ball is going to bounce by 15 feet in this drill. Maybe the two inches over there that you think you saw a ball out, you might have misjudged that too, so don't let it wreck you. Like, you've got to kind of understand where you're, where you're coming from. So we had them stay back and do that for a long, until they started getting it. And, and for a while, they're like, oh, you're kind of, can we move on to something else? It's like, hey, well, show me you can do it, because this is important. If you, see them, if you can judge, it's going to land in zone one as it's crossing the net. You get a good head start, you'll get to that short ball. It won't be such a bad thing. If it's in two, you should be able to recognize, hey, this is a ball I'm going to be able to attack on, do more with, maybe take a little more um, aggressive stance on it. <laughs> if it's landing in three, then you're going to play more defense. So they started getting, right out of the gate, a better idea of what they should accomplish. Um, one of the terms we use a lot when we're, when we're kind of talking to our ladies about this stuff is we say, hey, our, our teams play with a lot of tennis dyslexia. Okay? What I mean that is somebody hits you a nice marshmallow second serve, and you walk up to it, and they just kind of... You know, just push it over the net and make sure they don't miss it. But if I hit a nice, wide, hard cross court ball, they're diving into the fence trying to rip it down the line winner out of nowhere. They're saying, hey, 
you got it backwards. <coughs> when you're in trouble, throw up the lob. When you get the east ball, you've got to hit it. But they tend to go backwards. So when they don't have time to think, they just swing away. And you give them a little bit of time to think about it, and they get real tight on that shot. So we try to kind of explain to them, hey, when you get that zone two ball, that's the one we want you to go after. And three, you can slow down. So by giving those zones kind of some purpose and naming them to something, it's helped them really understand, and they can talk to each other better too, because their partners at the net, um, the other day we had a team that was playing in their match, and, the, and I could hear the partner say, hey, I can't poach, could you keep hitting in his own two? <laughs> and so the net girl couldn't go, because her partner was like, hey, I need you to get more active than that, help me out on some of these shots. She's like, I can't, you keep leaving in his own two, so I can't go, because she can beat me down the line, she's going across court. And her partner was like, oh, I didn't realize my ball was laying in there. So she made the adjustment, started hitting it's three, all of a sudden they got a lot more active at the net. So they've been able to take some of this stuff and translate it to be able to talk to each other instead of like, you know, hey, your shots suck, I can't poach on your shots. They're being able to say, hey, it's landing in this area, you know why I can't poach, we've talked about that in, in the lesson. So that kind of depth recognition for them has been really big, and we were really surprised, like I said earlier, about how bad they were at that at first. Uh, but that's something that's really kind of helped them and moved it on. So but we stuck with that for quite a while. Then kind of the next step we started getting into that with our players um, is that we said, okay, now we're going to do this. We're going to put you guys back, all four back again, and you've got to hit every ball into zone three. Try to get the ball deep. If it's not, keep the rally going. Don't, don't worry about it, but that's the goal for every shot in this drill. Okay? Because what they had to figure out was you can't hit every ball this high over the net and make it go to zone three. But everybody doubles like, I gotta keep the ball low, and the lady's gonna poach. She's gonna take every ball if I don't keep it super low. Well, if you hit it cross court enough, that lady's not gonna poach on that ball, and you could still you know, have some better net clearance to get the ball deep. So we worked on them trying to figure out what is the best um, combination of speed, spin, power to get the ball to be in the zones that we want it to be in. And so it took a minute to figure out that they could clear the net by four feet, still get it back there, and it's not really a poachable ball by the lady at the net and they started finding out what that range needed to look like for them. Because when we first said start hitting the ball deep, the first thing that happened was what? They started smashing the ball and hit them into the fence, trying to get it deep just by hitting it harder all the time. So it's not about just pure speed, it's about the mix of speed, spin, and, and height. And then they started figuring out what that looked like, and they got a better visual picture uh, about what a deep ball looks like. Because we try to, like I said, we try to ask a lot of questions. Some of it was like, hey, how are you gonna get that ball deeper? What is it in your head what does a good forehand cross-court deep look like? And like, oh, it's fast, it's low. And I was like, well, all those things mean it's going to be short. Like, it's not going to go deep enough, it's that low. So once we showed them and they got a better, like, visual picture of what that ball is supposed to look like in their head, they started making better adjustments, started seeing that they could hit that kind of ball. And they got deeper with the ball, but they also stayed more consistent because they weren't just trying to only add the power to it. Um, but a whole lot of zone two balls happen in that, right? Most of the balls are landing just behind the service line, right there in that nice safe spot where they all play. Um, how many of y'all have heard the comment from players when you come off the court? It's like, okay, we played this lady this week, and no matter what we did, she could put a ball right there every single shot. No matter where I hit it, she did that to me all day long. You hear it all the time, right? She could do that from anywhere. And I was like, okay, well, you need to give me your name and number because we're going to go play on the tour next week in mixed doubles. So let me know who she is, and she's not a safe four out to play. And so what they were realizing is their ball was landing just past the service line in that zone two every single time, and usually out wide to the forehand. But we had no recollection of no understanding of what shot we were hitting. They're just seeing the response and saying, that lady could do that from anywhere. And so the question becomes, well, could she do it from her backhand? Well, I don't know. Like, was it her forehand? I don't know, she could do it every time. Like, <laughs> were you hitting it deep? I think I was. So you're asking all the wrong, you guys are, you're, in, you're, getting, you're giving yourself bad information because you're asking all the wrong questions. Like, where did my ball land to allow that to happen? And when you back them up a step and start actually getting them to understand what, what their shot's doing, then the response becomes a whole lot easier and you can understand how they can take things away. Because part of the process when we got into this, where their ball's landing and what shots were coming back, that we recognized was that they didn't have that connection. It's like my ball went in, I did my job. And that's kind of all it is. It's in, good. They had no con uh, understanding of that. So a lot of times when we're, we're teaching our, our ladies, we hear this comments like, well, if I do, if I goes there, she could, why would I want to post that ball? She could burn me down the line. And I'm like, if you get the ball deep to that corner and that lady can take a half volley off her back foot and go up the line with that ball, good art. Like that's a good shot. 
and they didn't realize that where the ball goes and the depth of the shot and where you're placing things reduces the options for the opponent. Like there, I think a lot of their thought is any shot can be made from anywhere, anytime, no matter what. And they have 57 options in their brain. They're trying to figure out what's coming. They're like, hey, we can knock this down to like two options if you put it in these right spots. If you do this, she's got about two options. And any other option outside of that is really low percentage. And we're not going to worry about it. Um, like one of the things we've tried to really instill in the past two seasons was, hey, if you don't get beat down the line six times in a match, you did it wrong. Because if you're going to count how many times you get beat down the line, you better count how many times you get beat down the middle. And if you take 25 out of the middle and lose six down the line, you're winning. But that is a very hard concept to get past people. Okay? For, the, for the ladies, because they take it very personally when they get beat down the line, right? So what we try to explain to them is, hey, you've got, if you're going to keep track, you're going to keep score, you got to keep track of all the scores. Or don't keep track of any of them, which is what we prefer. Okay, don't worry about how many times you can beat down the line if you're winning more down the middle than you're getting beat down the line. But I think they have that issue because when they're playing, if they get in the middle, they can look at their partner and go, okay, well, we're not sure whose ball that was, so we can't really blame anybody for that play. That was just a good shot. And they get burned down the alley, and like, oh, that was my alley. And they take all the blame for the shot. So just little things like that about how they've been thinking and what they're seeing has you know, kind of helped us be able to kind of back it up a step and make them kind of change the thought process. But changing anybody's thought process takes time. And so in all these steps we're talking about, we did at least one week of Alta Clinic per step. Well, that was the focus for that entire lesson plan. And then we went to the next one. Um, so as we got to the next one, we said, okay, we've got the ball going deep. We understand what a good deep ball looks like. We understand what we're trying to do with that ball. We understand that, hey, once you go deep, the down line shot's not, as, not on the table as much if you get them backing up for that ball. Your net person can be a little more aggressive. A lot of things can happen with that ball. So now we said, okay, what happens now when we move the net team, and we put two people on the service line here, two people on the baseline right there? Now, where is our target for the baseline players? Move the target up to be, hey, now the target is 0-2. It's at that middle zone, because now it's at their feet. If they come in and we keep saying, okay, we're just every ground stroke has to be a deep ball, and we rally that deep ball cross court, it's now about right here for the bottle leader to come and attack us with the ball. So then we said, okay, part of what drives your depth, part of what drives your decision-making process when you're playing is your opponent's positioning on the court, right? So then we made them stay at the service line and we had them figure out from the baseline, how do I get the ball to dip at the service line? Okay, it's a combination of, like we said before, it's height, spin, and speed. So if you don't have, if they hit a very flat ball, we say, hey, when that lady comes forward and starts coming at you, everybody's first thought is what? Smash. Rip it at her. You know, Here she comes, get her. We hit it hard, the ball stays nice and high, and they stick the volley right back at us and it gets back on us really quick. So we said, hey, if you had a flatter ball, you've got to slow that ball down. So we worked on them hitting that medium speed ball, and <coughs> grabbing to that ball down and landing it at the service line. That took a minute, okay? That's, that's hard to do when you see somebody coming at you, not to panic and make that easier ball. If you got higher level players, spin the ball more, just work on the angle attack of the ball, have a little more dip, a little more drop, hitting it there. Um, and then we said, okay, the other thing is we've got to get the volleyers going to take that ball and go back deep. And we're trying to get that to happen because the biggest problem that we see in depth control of what happens is everybody's heard what? Hit the ball deep and what? Move in, right? But there's levels to that. We try to tell, like, the explanation I gave to ladies was, hey, when you hit the ball deep, we do want you to move in. But you can get, there's more to that sentence. If I hit the deep player and I hit a good deep approach shot, I want to move in, split step, before they hit it, should be somewhere service line-ish area, and then I make the next shot. If I'm the net player, if they hit a good deep ball, I'm gonna move in from my spot at the service line where they're returning it, I'm gonna move more up to like the middle of the box. They here hit the ball and go in, and they think hit the ball and go in, and I'm all in the net, close on the net. And it's too much, there's more detail to that than we try to explain to them. It's like, hey, you gotta hit the ball, move to this specific spot going forward. Or you're going to get to this place if you're the baseline person. You're not going baseline to here in one shot. And so trying to get them to have more detail to follow up with, not such a generalized term of, hey, hit it deep, go in. Hit it short, stay, you know, or, you know, drop shot and move forward on the ball. I try to give them a lot more detail about what they're trying to understand what it looks like. Because once we've given them a better visual picture in their brain about what the really good shot actually looks like, I, that opened up a lot of their eyes because they, they did not, like when you ask them, like, what do you think a good volley looks like? 
when you take it and you hit the ball real hard and you slice it hard, you can't get this high over the net, that's a great boss. It's like, well, hey, like, but if it's back at the baseline, the ball's below, like knee high, you, you can't hit that volley with any kind of consistency. That's not a good look, at, that's not a good volley in there. So I'm trying to get them to understand there's different variations of those shots uh, based off where you are in depth on the court. It was, was very eye-opening to them. Um, the next we had we had one um, team trying to hit to so like all the people staying back. Everybody started the rally, and then we had their move based off the depth of the opponent's ball that we had. So we had the first one being, hey, everybody try to keep that ball deep. Work on how to get more depth out of shot, keep it out of that zone two area. Then we moved into okay, zone two is the right area to hit when the net team, when the players come up to the net. But the net team is still trying to push that back player back to give them time and space so they can't get up to the net with them and get on equal ground. So then the step three we did is, okay, now we're gonna start all four players back and we're gonna give you a rally ball to start out. Depending on where the ball landed, now you have to make the decision of what to do. So as we hit a deep ball, you stay back. If you can keep that ball in the zone three area, you're gonna force the other team to stay back. They're not allowed to come in on this. As soon as that ball gets into zone two, we wanted both players to come in and look to try to hit an aggressive shot out of that area of the court. What we found out was as they got better at now judging where the ball is gonna bounce, Short balls were no longer an issue to get to because they were reading it earlier, coming forward earlier, they noticed where the ball is going to land, they could call out one, two, or three before as the ball is crossing the net, and now getting up to these short balls, attacking on the, the better depth, being able to get to the ball when it's above the net instead of below the net, really helped them out. So that progression um, started to show up in this drill. The other part was when it landed in zone two, we were trying to really kind of break away from that, you know, what we talked about earlier is that tennis dyslexia. When they get that short ball, instead of just taking the short ball and just kind of rolling it cross court to make sure I didn't miss the approach shot, we actually had to try to go for a shot. We said, hey, you are moving up into zone two. You could either hit the ball to <clears throat> zone one, which is the short court, or zone three to the back. But a zone two ball's got to either go to three or one. It can't go back to zone two. The only reason we let them go to zone two if you're that lady came in behind her zone two ball and now she's at the service line, we gotta go at zone two. But generally they don't come in behind the short ball. Um, and what that did was it kind of gave them an oak, like the a get out of jail free card, so to speak. Or when they got up to that short ball they were gonna hit it, it allowed them, because we told them when you get that ball you have to go for one or three, to go for a shot instead of get up there and hit that just kind of bunt, just get it in, hopefully I don't miss shot. Because we told them, hey, at this play you gotta go for it. What they started recognizing as we got through all those things is saying, hey, if they missed it, their partner wasn't mad at them because we told them they were supposed to go for the shot. Because we asked them, like, what is the biggest reason, like, you don't hit that ball? Why don't you do that? And it all comes down to it based on, like, fear. It's the fear of missing, the fear of my partner getting mad at me, the fear of, you know, the team watching me saying, oh, she's no good, we should put her lineup next week. All the things that come from those things. But we just said, hey, you gotta let that go. That is the right shot there. Everybody on your team now knows, we're telling you in all these clinics over and over again, that's the shot you go for. So if you miss it, everybody on the team knows, that's the one you go for. If you get mad at you when you get that shot and you run it to them and then the lady hits a lob past your partner down the line, that's where you should get mad because you had a chance to hurt them with the ball and you didn't. And that's helped kind of open them up to not being so scared going for that shot, okay? So what we did is said, hey, when you get that short ball, you gotta go for something. So when they came in, and they started seeing that, they, okay, now my approach shot hit in zone two over there, and now the lady burns me out wide, or I hit it in zone two, we were trying to come in, and that's when the lob got So the pattern recognition started really helping when they started recognizing the depth of shot and where their ball was actually landing to what was, what was hurting them. And so they started connecting the dots between, hey, my shot dictates what comes back. She's not just making any shot from anywhere all the time, okay? And so that really kind of cleared up some of that to where now they're taking, when things happen and they lose the point, they're not saying, okay, she burned me down the line. We're hearing them say, hey, my shot was short. I set her up. And so they're starting to recognize where the point got away from them based off the depth of their shot and what's happening instead of, oh, that lady just hit a good shot. Oh, she's got a great return. Oh, she's got a good cross-court short ball. It's like, hey, she's burning me with the short ball because if my ball's short. That's what's causing it. If I go deep, that shot's off the table. And that's, been, that's really changed how they've approached the play and problem solving. So we've watched, you know, I've been there 11 years now in we watched for nine, 10 years of play. And we have some people that have finally, after watching for nine years, play a little bit different match. I'm sure some of y'all could show up at your alpha matches, go to sleep, wake up right when the match is over, and tell them exactly what they did right and wrong the whole match. And they'll walk away going, oh, you're right, that was exactly what happened today. And I've actually seen that happen. <laughs> 
Um, they, they just didn't even, they didn't watch the point of the match. And the ladies caught him walking out the, the shop door. Did you see my match? Yeah, I saw your match today. You did this, this, this. And they're like, God, we knew it. And the pro had been inside for the last two hours working on stuff that he didn't work on. So didn't even see a point, but it was, they were like, oh, it was exactly what happened. And so they have the same match over and over. So we're trying to get them to back up, see things different, so they actually play a different match and you can adjust to the different people they're seeing. So, so now we've got like step one, step two, step three. We get to step four. Um, we're trying to get that earlier recognition like that for the, for the zone two ball to come in. And then the biggest part of that one when we start coming forward based off that is the not panicking at the baseline. When you see that person come in, getting them to actually calm down to put that ball in zone two and not try to open it that ball, that's generally the hardest piece of that. So we work a lot on having, you know, feed a deep ball, have the team come in behind it, and then try to work on that easier pace ball and trust that gravity can make that ball drop. We spent quite some time doing that in the lessons to get that kind of skill in there. But again, this is that marketing principle we talked about. We stuck to it and made them stick with it and made them do it over and over again to where they got it instead of just, hey, we're going to work in this shop for 10 minutes, hopefully we get it. Next week we're moving on something else. Maybe two years from now we'll go back to the shop. And we really tried to hammer it for many, many weeks in a row, and it started to pay off because it started to do that. Um, now, when we get the net players up to the net and we start working on this more one-on-one -on -one back, um, we said, hey, as a net player, as long as you're hitting back towards, if you don't have a put-away type ball, okay, you're going, you get a ball that comes to you, you don't feel like you can put that ball away, their targets have to be one and three, like zone one and zone three when you're up here at the net. Because you either got to push the lady back with your volley and try to get her backwards, get her on her back foot, put her on defense. And if you do that, we don't want you to crash the net. We want you to move to the middle because you're kind of forcing the lob out of that lady if you push her on her heels. If you can go to zone one and dump the ball shorter up here, have a little touch on the volley, now you can close it a little tighter because that lady's struggling to get to the short ball and get in there. And that's exactly the opposite of what we see all the time, right? You see at the short ball, and because that lady's running at you, your first instinct is back up. Okay, but she's not running at you, she's running at you. Her rack's down, she's struggling, and so we try to get them to close in behind that even when the other lady's coming forward, because that is a very unnatural thing for them to look for. They see somebody running at them and their first thing is take a couple steps back. Okay, so we try to get them to kind of get out of that backwards um, <coughs> thought process with that. Now, if we're volleying and that lady's trying to serve a volley or tries to come in behind the ball and she hits it at me, now we do want to go back at that zone two ball to get the ball on her feet instead of trying to go short where she can already keep coming in or go deep, where it's now above her waist when she comes to take that. So by keeping up with those three zones on all the different shots and what's happening in the play, it's really helped the ladies diagnose what's happening much quicker, much better, and coming up with a lot better information to make adjustments while they play. Um, some of the things we've worked on, you can kind of throw in there. We, we come up with a lot of terms when we play at, at Ansley just to kind of make them remember things. So what we call it, like as they get better at these zones, we've taken the zones from being kind of straight lines. Like if you look at the court over here, they have the, the 10 U lines, like that line. We take it and we angle it. And so, I wonder if you can see it. Um, as you kind of do, we angle them off. So we have an angle that goes from about So as they get better with that control, we shorten up the areas and call have little triangles, which that's the zone three triangle, that's the zone uh, one triangle, and then all that middle area is zone two that we're trying to avoid and stay out of. So when we were doing it one day, uh, one of the guys used to work here said, hey, it looks like a slice of pizza, so we're going to yell pizza. So every time the ladies hit in that back corner, they're like, pizza! And they knew they were supposed to go, and that was a good deep ball that could get in there. And so just by saying, having a little thing like that, they remember it, giving it a name, and they would do it, and even the ladies that were watching the matches, as they would start watching the matches, ball lays in the corner, and somebody would go put the ball away at the net because they saw the deep ball, they crossed on it, put it away. Everybody that was watching the match was like, nice pizza shot. And then the ladies probably thought they were insane, but, but they all knew what they were talking about, right? So when we, when we hit that ball to that deep corner, or we go to the short pizza for, for number for zone one if you get that short ball. So we short, we make the zones get smaller so they get better at it. And we increase that zone two area to try to keep it out of there so we that, to avoid that middle section. Okay? Um, so when you do have the good deep and the good short ball, the, the net person's job is pretty easy, right? You move up, try to be much more aggressive towards the center of the court because you put the other team on defense. When the ball lands in that big zone two area, the different things that we've said there is, hey, now your job as a net player is to follow the ball. Stay in front of the ball. Where the ball bounces, get in front of the ball. 
So if they do go to zone two down the middle, yeah, the net push is a little over there a little bit. If it goes wide in zone two, yeah, the net push kind of stay a little more conservative. So they don't poach on those balls. That's their job as the net player. So as a net player, I'm also judging where the balls land, right? They have to see as their partner's balls crossing the net, where do I think it's going to land so that I know which way I'm going to go. I'm going to either be more aggressive to the middle, I'm going to stay more in front of the ball, but they've got to have that good ball recognition. But what happens is, as a net player, what do they pay attention to? Two when the ball's not hit to them. When their partner's hitting the ball. They're, only, they're looking back at their partner hit the ball, they watch the ball fly across the net, and then they watch just to see that it's in. So we even started doing stuff where we would have a rally going and we would say freeze. Net person had to go over and circle the mark on the court where the ball lay. Now they were circling a mark, but rarely were they circling the mark. They were not close to where that ball landed because they were so worried as their partner shot going in. They didn't recognize actually where the depth of that stuff was. <coughs> and as a, as a pro, like, that baffled us for a while. Because we're like, man, how did you not see where that ball landed? But I think all of us have played for so long, worked on those things for so long, that we don't recognize that ladies have started playing tennis when they're 35, 40 years old, whatever, that are 3 5, 3 0, 4 0 type players. Most of them grow up playing this game. So a lot of the things that I think we all take for granted as pros, that we say just as, like, this is how this should work, just do this. That information, that the base for that to, information to make sense of them is just not there. So when we've broken it down really, really basic and built it kind of back up this way, we're starting to finally see them really get it and, and take it to heart, and it's made a big difference in how the lesson program has worked. Um, another one that we said is, okay, we, we <laughs> describe this area of the court. So if you take the service box and draw a big plus mark in the middle, a big addition sign, right? From here to here, this corner of the service box, the outside back corner of the service box, we kind of deem those as like the box of death. Stay on the box of death, don't be there. So if the ball goes back to your partner and you're up here, you can fall back to the middle, the ball goes up, you can go here and here, but don't go to that corner, right? And everybody, as soon as the ball starts happening, that net lady starts backing up and backing away and working the way to that side, especially when the ball goes to this person, they're trying to get away. And we're trying to really make them hold their ground in the middle to prevent that angle between the baseliner and the net person to get smaller, take that away. So we really, we like, we have play courts at our club, which helps, we draw a lot on the ground. So we take like a, a line marker and draw off that box and put a giant X in the box, like that stay out of it. And every time when we get down on the corner, they go, hey, look where you're standing. And they look down, they're like, oh, we're in the box of death. Like they can see it on the court. And so that's really helped them also stay in the point and get in better position and allows them from where they are. Because when they're starting in that position there, if we do want them to poach, because they're part, they see a ball three, they see a ball go to zone three, and that person's supposed to make a poach move. If they're starting kind of in that back corner, they have no shot of getting up and getting to this ball, but it's just because they've drifted over not aware of where it is. Um, you know, what, a lot of things that we're doing kind of based with that, even with just the rally balls, we kind of call out that freeze thing, yeah, and say, hey, where are you standing? And they look down and it's like, cool, I'm a foot inside the baseline. I said, do you have any idea you're standing inside the court? No, I thought I was outside the baseline. And so it's little things like that that, I, that we're taking for granted, like, hey, you keep walking inside the court. And they're like, no, I'm not. And they look down and they're like, okay, I'm inside the court. So we have to make sure that we you know, kind of give them a little bit more fundamental basics to understand so that when we start saying all the basic things that we think are just automatic tennis things, um, that they get them, okay? Um, when we go to, uh, when we play a lobber, this one always comes up, okay? Jalaba Sadef. We can't do anything, all they do is locks. Okay, so how do, how, do we, how do we make sure that we disarm the lock? Okay, every single ball that they give us, we're trying to go as close to zone two and zone one as we can. <laughs> Don't go deep. And they're like, well, we kept, you know, shoot lobbits, we try to hit the ball deep and come in. I'm like, so if we get the ball deep and come in, what are you susceptible to? The lock. And they're like, well, well yeah. And I say, so you're getting lobbed to death, but you're playing away that's forcing her to lob, and you're moving in and putting yourself out of position for the lot, and they're like, well, yeah. <laughs> like, well, we probably don't need to set them up for the lob, so let's try to go a lot with a lot of short balls. And so they start pulling them forward, they start seeing the lobs, projecting those lobs get a lot steeper, and they come down a lot shorter, so they can cover the lobs, and everything works a whole lot better. But I think they've always been told, like, hey, hit the ball deep and come in, hit the ball deep and come in. It's that same thing, it's too, that's too basic of a phrase. It's like, hey, if you're playing against somebody that likes to hit the ball hard and wants to try to come in, hit the ball deep and come in and keep them from coming in. If you have a lady that plays 14 feet behind the baseline and just stands on her back foot, lobs 400 times a match, you've got to, hit the, you've got to be able to go short. 
So when we started working on that concept, the big thing we had to do there was we spent, I don't know what, 15, 20 minutes a week where we pet, put a person in that corner and a person in that corner of the service box, and they just had to chip the ball across court. Yeah. And then we'd make them switch and chip the ball the other way. And it's much more difficult for most of the players to hit the ball soft than hit the ball fast. The ball comes and the racket just gets quick. And so they can't go soft. So to actually make them feel how slow the racket had to move to go to that short one ball, that took quite a while. We spent uh, like three or four weeks with that being part of the warm up. For like 15 minutes of the warm up was just <coughs> that. Taking that ball and hitting it soft, taking it short, going cross court. So then everybody knows how to chip the ball, slice the ball, put the ball short when they need it. And that was a that was a game changer for a lot of our teams, especially the, the players that um, that like to be more aggressive and do hit the ball harder to be able to back that hard shot up with the soft ball when they came in there. And I mean, to all, like I said, to everybody standing here, you're like, well, that's stupid basic. Hit the ball deep when you back them up, you hit the short because are not there. But that's something they don't see. You know, they, I think when they're when we're talking about visually looking at the court, a lot of things we try to do is say, hey, imagine being above this court and looking down. You've got a person that's back, a person that's up, a person that's up, a person that's back, and you're looking down on them. Where are the openings on the court? And they can sit there and go, oh, yeah, the opening is here, because that lady's back, the opening's there, because that lady's back. They're like, so that's the short part of the court. When they're looking out, all they see is there's somebody in my way this way, there's somebody in my way this way, there's no openings. But they're not seeing three dimensionally, hey, the opening's behind that lady, the opening's in front of this lady, and they're not seeing that. They just see that there's somebody here and somebody here. I just can hit the ball because there's nowhere to go to try to hurt them right now. And it's, it's basic things like that that they're just having that bad information they're giving themselves. So that was a, a big one for us, and we spent a lot of time doing that so they could actually slow the ball down. Spent a lot of time making that zone two approach shot being the short ball instead of trying to drive deep, dump it short. And we joke to people, like, hey, if you play a lady that's got two knee braces, that's pregnant, that's over 65, if you don't have a drop shot, then you're missing out. Like, you should do it all day long until they call you bad names. Okay? Just keep doing it because that's, that's what should happen because that's what the opening is going to be. Um, and then we started putting this together okay, at, at the last step to kind of make this more of a team concept because what we were trying to explain to everybody was, hey, these patterns are going to be there and we want to make sure we understand what this is because when y'all are playing, we've got to play more as a team. I said, you know, if you're watching a football game on TV, when they huddle up, they don't get in the huddle and go, everybody go do what you want, break. Okay? But we play in tennis and then what happens? Hey, uh, you know, John, what are you going to try to do on this point? I'm just going to try to get it in. Okay, that's not a plan. The object, you know, get it out. Like Nobody's trying to hit it out. So hitting it in is not a plan. What are you going to do with the play? You're going to try to hit it to a certain spot. Uh, we've had the comments come back like, hey, this lady's return was unbelievable. She could kill every ball. And her return was outstanding. Well, what return was? What do you mean? It's like, was her forehand good? Was her backhand good? Was serving to the body? Did she return that one well? Did she return a hard serve better, a soft serve better? I don't know. And I was like, well, I watched your match and 99% of your serves went wheelhouse to her forehand. So her forehand looked really good. But you didn't move her right or left. You didn't even know. She, you don't even know if she has a backhand. You didn't see one for the entire match. Because all you were trying to do was get your serve in. You weren't trying to place it and move it around. So we try to make this be more a team play, where every point they have to get as a team and say, "Hey, I'm returning this ball," and I tell my partner, "Hey, I'm going to do a three-one." Okay, I'm going to try to go three-one on this play. So as soon as the ball comes to me to serve, I'm trying to hit the return back to three. I'm looking for a zone two where I'm going to dump it in zone one. That's my play. I'm going to run a thirty-one. Okay, so now my net partner knows, hey, if I get that ball in zone two, he, or he's going to try to dump it in zone one, so I get to move in and be real aggressive on the next ball. I'm looking for that ball so that I'm already ahead of the game. I can anticipate what's about to happen because I know what my partner's trying to do on this one. Now, it doesn't mean I do it right every time. My ball, if I go to zone two, so then I have to kind of wait to get a zone three ball. But my partner knows what I'm trying to do. On second serves, we try to flip it and say, hey, run a lot of 13s on second serves. You get a second serve, chip that ball, use that nice soft return, real short, pull her in, and then once she comes in, then you can smash the ball past her to zone two or zone three and put the ball away. So you're going to run 13. Okay? And that gave them like this idea of like, we can play more together. My shot affects my net part more. I can't just tell my partner, like, hey, you know, we lost today because, you know, Rob just doesn't coach. Just, just, you know, he just stands over there. And I'm like, well, if you hit every ball to zone two up there, then you're right. Well, kind of got to hang out with you can't go. So they've started to put those pieces together based off having a more of a team dynamic plan. Okay? Not just 
hey, I'm going to try to put my ball in, see what you can do. Um, and that kind of opened up their eyes to having more control because that fear part we talked about comes when they don't, when they feel like they don't have control of what's happening. The fear comes from, hey, her forehand was so good, I didn't know what to do. But you can take that fear away by saying, hey, we're just going to give her a forehand, we're going to make her a backhand returns, and now her backhand returns is marginal, and now I'm not scared of her return. So by, by backing it up and controlling what we're doing, it took away a lot of that fear, and, and we saw a lot less kind of choking on the big points, or like it is giving up the easy shots on the big points in all those matches, because they started to feel like, hey, we get to control what happens all the time. We're in control of the match, not them. Because we make the comments to them when we start running through all these things a lot, when we start getting into the patterns of play, like, hey, you guys always say what? Hey, let's go out and do what today? Let's play our game, right? Gotta play our game. And I was like, okay, great, what's your game? Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, well, we're supposed to play our game. And I'm like, well, what is that? And they don't know, they just know that's what they've been told their whole life. Hey, play your game, play your game. And like, what is, they don't know what that means. That's like saying, hey, go run a 4240, Pat, go. And it's like, well, what, what, I can't do that. Like, so we have to make sure we tell them what their game is. And their game is these patterns of play. And that way they have a game plan. They're controlling what's happening. And it's all based off these easy depth numbers. Now, like I said, there's a million ways to learn all these things. It's, none of this is groundbreaking new, but I think the way we tried to explain it and the way we kind of broken it down for them, the ladies really took heart to it. And they took it where they believe it's right, they understand what's going on, and they've been able to put it together. Um, Matt, how yes. long was the process to go through this transformation? So we did, this was our, this lesson plan I kind of walked through with you guys, was what we did for an out to season. So this was like 10 weeks of lessons. Okay. So each one of those steps, like when, when we went back here to to start to divide the court into those sections, the way, the way that we run our clinics is we do like a 30 minute kind of warm up drilling where you hit lots of balls. Uh, some live ball, but a lot of dead ball drills, a lot of, uh, you know, Deep ball, short ball, volley, volley, overheads, and all kind of movement things. Lots of drilling for 30 minutes. And then we say, okay, now the middle 30 is kind of the meat of our lessons. And that middle 30, week one, all we did was divide that court into those three sections, have the ladies rally have, as the ball's coming across the net, calling out what depth that it was. And then we rotated them around, they were different people, and some people had more slice, tops to them, whatever, they had to kind of figure out how to work against all those different levels. So we spent pretty much the entire 30 minutes in that middle section doing that so they can get better at that. And then the last 30 minutes what we did is said, okay, we're gonna play out a point and if you can hit the ball in the zone three and then come up with a winner on the next shot, you got like three points in the game to play games of 10, but it was still based off just that one thing that week. And if we felt like they kind of really started to get that, then next week we moved to the next section, which was, hey, now we're gonna start everybody rallying and if you don't hit the ball in the zone, Zone three, the rally keeps going. If you don't hit it zone three, the rally keeps going, but every time your ball lands short of zone three, the other team gets a point. It's like the first one with 30 wins, right? So we kind of moved to just getting it to zone three, not just recognizing where the other ball was gonna land. So it went from what's the opponent's ball gonna do to where's my ball going to. But that was week two's kind of uh, thought process. And if they didn't get that, we would kind of take that maybe mix it up a little bit, but kind of keep with that same thought for week three as well. Once we felt like we got it, then we moved to the next one. So it, it took kind of eight weeks to get through this process just on the depth. Uh, we did more the season before in a process similar to this, um, just off really like watching the ball. So we were trying to take really, really simple concepts and build a season's worth of lessons around them so that by the time that eight weeks is over, they actually have that. They actually get it, they actually have produced like what we're looking for them to do. Instead of saying, hey, we're gonna work on eight different things this season for one week at a time, and you're not gonna get any of it, you might remember three key phrases we said, and that's it. Right? Yeah. Matt, what you got? Matt, I think that's really wise. I think as coaches, we all have a tendency because we might teach 30 hours of the same lesson. You come to the next week, you're like, we gotta do something different. Right. But your, your, your students have only had it for one hour. Right, and we do this, when we go lesson plan for our teams like this, we teach this to every single Alta team that we have the entire week. That's week one's plan for every team. Now, it doesn't mean if we have a C8 team that we might not, you know, simplify it a little bit and say, hey, maybe zone three becomes, maybe you're only dividing it two zones. Like for the very, very beginners, it's either zone one in front of the service line, zone two as you get past the service line. So you can, you can make, you know, make it a little bit more basic, but we teach that same plan to every single team all the time. And for two reasons. One is, 
then nobody can say, well, you like their team better, you gave them better information, you're not helping our team, where's it falls? Okay? So whether you're a C8 team or AA3, they watch and they listen to what happens and all the other lessons going on. And if you give them all the same lesson, nobody can say that they don't have the same information. The other part is, when you have people that do move up and change teams, as they start moving up and changing teams, they still all have the same information. So that when we have a lady that's number one on our E4 team and did really well and jumps up to play on the A4 team, she knows all the same stuff that the A4 team was working on last season when she moves to that team. It's not a thing where she has to catch up. She's already got that information. So, yeah, we stick with that. And so um, by the time the week is over, I think we can give the lesson with our eyes closed, so to speak, because we, we've said the same thing a hundred times. But we're seeing the, the, the players really kind of latch onto it and understand it and come back. And we get all, all the comments are, you wouldn't believe it. We went out there and we ran the 3-1 and it worked. I'm like, we're not lying to you. This is, the, this is how you do it. But they're shocked when it does work, right? And they're, they get excited because they, they can see what's happening, understand what it is, and they feel like they're getting to take control a lot. Um, which, like I said, that's, I think, our biggest take from all this when we're seeing all these things happen is that they feel like they control the match. And when they lose, we're not hearing, like, oh, that lady was so good, there's nothing we could do. They come off the court, man, we just could not get the ball to zone two. Everything we hit today went in zone two. We just were not finishing our shots. We weren't getting the ball high enough. Everything was zone two, and that's how we lost. But then they take that away, like, hey, well, so what are you going to do next time? We're going to keep it out of zone two. We're going to fix that. And then again, they feel like they have control of that match. They're not so crushed or, you know, feel like they had no idea what to do today. They, they understand what can happen, even if they didn't accomplish it that week. And that's gone a long way to them kind of keeping their confidence throughout the season, even if they have a bad week and they lose, they understand why they lost it, what immediately is the, the fix they can do better next time. Um, so the other thing that we've done to kind of, once we get to the very end of this and we've gotten kind of the end of the season, we ran a five ball drill and made the first shot non-negotiable. Okay, so we started them out and said, hey, we're gonna play out five balls in a row before we kind of reset. And we made it non-negotiable. So we said, hey, we're going to start out the first ball. We're going to feed it deep. We're going to make it a round. So we're going to go to zone three. You've got to hit, try to go zone three back, right? And then we said, okay, as soon as that point, we're going to play out that point from there. That's the only thing is that first ball has to be that deep rally ball of zone three. The second time, we're going to take a real deep ball and push you back. You've got to go back, let the ball bounce, back up, play it as an offensive ball. So we want you to really add height to this ball, add some shape, get the ball to go, go back deep. You can bob over that push set if you want, but you've got to play a defensive shot on the first ball, and if you get that ball into zone three, then you get to move up and try to get at least back to neutral, if not take over the point from there. Ball four, ball three was we fed the ball to the net player, made them take that ball back to zone three and start it. Ball five, ball four was a out wide ball. We said, hey, you get a zone two ball out wide, we want you to go back wide with that shot there, right? So we said, hey, short wide ball, short wide return. And then the last one was we fed that same real deep defensive ball back to the baseline player, and they took that ball in the air, and they could take that ball and come in. So the idea of that was we ran that drill over and over and over and over again for a day. And what we tried to make them understand was, hey, we're trying to reduce the amount of thought you guys have when the ball comes. Okay? Because when that deep ball comes, you can almost see the smoke come out of people's ears. They're thinking about so many different options of what they want to do with that ball when they have time to think about it. And we said, okay, if it's really deep and you don't come take it out of the air, your shot is that deep zone three ball. That's your only option. When you are playing in your match, hit that shot. Okay? If you are getting a wide short ball, look for the angle ball back. Don't try to hit it super deep because you're off the court and the middle opens up. So try to angle it off back if you can. You know, and we said uh, you know, that way that's a one shot thing. Get out there, try for that ball. You don't think too much. Okay? When you get that, if you can come take the ball in the air a lot, you recognize the lob's coming, you can move up and take that ball in the air, take it in the air and move in. But again, just take it out of the air, try to take it away from you, push the ball back deep to zone three if you can, because you're too deep to try to make a short ball out of that shot. Take that ball back to zone three, come up and stop early in case they lob that. Okay, so but those, those ideas there, we ran them over and over again to again, take away some of the options so that they didn't overthink every shot. They weren't trying to make all these zone, the, the, the smoke just start coming out of their ears because they're trying to think about so many options they could do off every single ball. Because lots of them just aren't available. And so this way we gave them a high percentage play to at least start every point and not have to overthink that, at least put them in a good position to begin with. And, and that tended to really help. So by the time we put the, the 31 play together, the 13 play together, and then we had that five ball drill where we made them understand, hey, on this first ball, there's one option for each of these five shots we want you to start with. Um, it really made the percentage of how they played, the high percentage points played much better. Um, they worked better together as a team. They were talking more than that. They were kind of 
gelling a lot more as a team instead of just two people out there trying to get balls and put balls in play. Um, like I said, we did this for the entire season. Um, and it's, so we've had a lot of success. We had two teams last week that were in the city finals. We'll find out Wednesday if one of them won. So, so far, it's, it's, been, it's been working. Um, so, when you guys are, are, are kind of trying to implement this, like I said, it can be done with anything. We've done it with more than just depth. Depth is just the one we did this season, so we kind of walked you through that. But think about a really basic concept, you know, the things that you say the most to all the people that you're teaching. Like, how many times a day do you say, watch the ball? So we started saying, okay, watch the ball disappear. So when the ball's coming at you, you know, keep your head down, you have to hit it, and the ball has to disappear before you can look up to see the next shot. When you say watch the ball, it comes in, and they try to watch the ball go out to, and their head moves, they don't see the ball. So it's little things like that that we started trying to say, hey, what do we say the most? How can we break that down to be something like stupid simple, and then just kind of build it from there throughout the season to where after eight, 10 weeks of Alta, it becomes a lot more of an automatic process of how they play, what they do. So it doesn't just have to be the depth, this is just like I said, the one we did this season, so it was kind of easy to walk through and explain, but we've done it now with a couple different things. But I think that that process, the ladies have liked it because it gave them enough time to figure it out, put it into play, see that it works. And because the whole team's getting into it, even when they come off the court, their their team can tell them, hey, you guys did a good job going at zone three. Every time you get to zone three, you poach today, that was really good. Or hey, that lady had that great drop shot, but it was only when you hit the ball to zone two. Like they're seeing it when they're watching as well. So when they go to play their matches, they're more aware of it too because they're noticing it. It's not just, you know, oh, good try, you guys played well. They can actually talk to each other about what happened and come up with better solutions. Um, so with that, is there any questions, doubts? You can tell me I'm full of it. But, uh, but yeah, whatever, where are you guys at? What's yes. that, Marcus? Hey, a question for you. Um, so you're talking about an eight-week progression, yeah. and you have the luxury, and a lot of us have the luxury of seeing the same teams season after season, so you're seeing them progress. What, how do you balance that progression if you're doing the same thing all season with, well, I've got three teams I'm on this week, I've got three matches this week, and I'm going to see the success only at the end of the season when we're not even in playoffs. How do you balance that out between, I've got a match this weekend, I've got a match next weekend, like, when am I going to see the fruits of my labor here? Is that only until after the season? And maybe you don't have that team. There's a lot of people who, who just have that team for a season and then they see sure. a different team. So how do you balance that out between instant success and see the forest, not yeah. just the tree? So the instant success really started in that first week. When they started being able to hit the ball deeper and recognize where the ball was landing, it immediately their movement got better. Because when they noticed as the ball's crossing the net, that I think that ball's going to be in zone three, Immediately, they were backing up and getting back and giving themselves space at that ball. Where at the beginning of that first day, the ball was coming in, they're like, three. And it's like, yeah, you're right, but now it's almost hit you in the foot. Like, you called it too late, you recognized it too late. And so they started really seeing some level of success with this, like right out of the gate. Um, yeah, three or four weeks into the season, they got much better at all this, and they started putting it to play and, and having to be able to um, implement it a lot better in patterns of play. But we saw immediately them get better at just ball spacing, recognizing the short ball, seeing it come low to the neck. Oh, low, net, low ball means go. It's going to be a short ball. And so they were getting some of the softer balls. They were getting to the shorter balls. They were not having trouble hitting soft second serves and looking for that ball to be a little higher, you know, to get up to it quicker and not let it drop so low. So some of that we saw immediately. I mean, yes, there's a little bit more of a long-term thing for some of the big pieces of the puzzle, but immediately they did – do better right out of the gate just by knowing, by seeing and knowing where the ball is going to land and having a better picture of, like we said, what a real good shot looks like. Like when I hit a, I, at first we hit that kind of loopy ball back to him, they're like, oh, that's like a lob. I'm like, that's not a lob. That ball only cleared the net this high and just had some topspin and landed back near the baseline. Like that's a, that's a good deep ball. And they, they, in their head, that was not what a good forehand looked like. And so when we were talking to them about, you know, they hit a good, what they think was a good forehand and it's this high of the net, it is. It's a good shot, but there's zero margin for error, and it's always going to be a shorter ball. But in their mind, that was the best shot I could hit. And once they kind of opened up to, oh wait, this shot might be a little better if I'm trying to push her back. And then the low shot's good if she comes into the net. Then they got, they were even the shots that they did already kind of own, they could use them at the proper time. And so they, they did see success better just by the decision making process really fast. Uh, but yeah, we try to always sell, hey, what's your, what's your goal here? If your goal is just to be better in two days, Good luck with that. Like you're just you're just not going to get much better, right? And that that's a problem we have in Atlanta is that there's so much league tennis 
that everybody comes to you on a Tuesday and says, you have one hour to make my serve good by Thursday. Okay, well, one of our pros almost got in trouble one time because his answer to that was, I'm not a beer quarter. <laughs> so I got all mad at him. But, but his point was the same. It's like, hey, you can't fix it in an hour for those kind of things. Um, so we're trying to get them to buy into, hey, the goal is, into this season, are you better than where you started the season? You know, and we try to tell them all the time, hey, if you lose a match today, you can come back on Friday and play again. We'll let you come back. You don't lose your membership because you lost a Thursday out match. Like, you can come back and do it again. So we've got them to buy a little bit more into the long term. They are seeing better short-term success because they bought into the fact that, hey, we're going to keep trying these things to get better. So in the short term, they are improving. But in the long term, they really have a better mindset of where they're trying to go, what they need to add. And we, we kind of use the phrase a lot, like we have more tools in our toolbox. If you don't have a slice, you know, forehand, you have to work on that once you get to a certain level because you need to go to pull the ball short. If you don't have the ability to drive the ball deep, you don't have the ability to hit a decent second serve, you know, welcome to B-level tennis for the rest of your life. So we try to get them to understand that process, and that helps them, you know, have the short-term gains, but also have a better long-term mentality for it as well.